step one and two of what has occurred is uh, this protein, the only protein, there's only a single protein associated with this mechanism, has uh, binding locations for uh, three sodium ions. And the mechanism is based on three sodium ions. You need to remember that number, okay? And uh, when the protein is accepting ions, when it's in this position of accepting sodium ions, if only one sodium ion uh, binds to the protein, nothing happens. If only two bind to the protein, nothing happens. But if three sodium ions bind to the protein and an ATP, because that's what you're looking at right here, an ATP molecule, phosphorylates the uh, portion of the protein. Okay, and you're about to see that phosphorylation. This currently is just showing ATP that is coming in ready to phosphorylate. But in this next sequence, two things have happened. One is it phosphorylated the protein. And you'll see that the sodium ions were released into the intercellular fluid. So uh, this looks like a, just a tiny little action, but I want you to imagine if that was happening over and over and over again. And sodium ions were just being moved from this fluid to this fluid. What it will soon do is create a concentration of sodium ions outside the cell and what the mechanism relies on uh, for a, a nerve impulse, a neuron impulse, is that we move potassium in the other direction. So you'll notice that this protein is now in a position, a better name for it would be a conformation. Okay, it's in a protein conformation that it's now open on the other side, and it's already released the sodium ions. That's one reason why it opened up. But it's also opened up so that now, the exact same protein can accept two potassium ions, and again, it's two. That's going to be important for what the end result of this is. If there's only uh, one potassium ion, nothing happens. But once a, a second potassium ion enters the protein, and as long as this protein is phosphorylated, then the protein will undergo another conformation change, another shape change, and that releases the two potassium ions to the inside. And again, that doesn't look like any big deal. Two potassium ions have moved to the inside. But this <coughs> pump, this active transport mechanism, is many of these scattered all along the axon's membrane. And three-dimensionally, they're all the way around the membrane. And just over and over again, using the ATP, uh, three sodium ions are being pumped out and two potassium ions are being brought in. And if you do that enough, okay, you will end up with a, a, a severe concentration gradient of many sodium ions uh, in the intercellular fluid and many potassium ions in the cytoplasm of the neuron. And uh, uh, what that does is create, if you remember from nervous system uh, terminology, it creates a charge difference. And that charge difference of the outside of the, of the axon to the inside of the axon is what's called the resting potential of the neuron. Now in some diagrams, in fact many diagrams of the resting potential, what you'll see is uh, a series of positive charges on the outside of the membrane. And then on the inside of the membrane, there'll be a series of negative charges. And if you'll notice, I haven't talked about even a single negative charge. Okay, so where does the negative charge come from? It's just not as positive as the outside. Exactly, it's a relative charge. If you put uh, three sodium ions 
pump to the outside, and then pump two potassium ions to the inside, you're always going to end up with more positive charges out here than you will in here, just by the sheer number of positive ions that you're talking about, three to two ratio. Okay. Plus, there are within this uh, cytoplasm, there are uh, proteins, okay, just resident proteins that are there for specific purposes. And as a general rule of thumb, most proteins have uh, more negative charges as part of their uh, makeup than they have positive charges. So that's adding a little bit of a negative charge to the cytoplasm anyway. But the, the positive outside, the negative inside is primarily due to the ratio of ions that the sodium potassium pump is designed to, to pump, okay? So um, again, if you are, you're gonna, this is useful describing and partially diagramming <laughs> this uh, pump for two purposes. One will be to explain the resting potential of, of a neuron, a resting potential when it is not sending uh, an impulse. But it's also useful, as I said, for an active transport mechanism if you need to describe one in a reasonable detail. I use the term uh, phosphorylates, and that's another term you should make sure that you are uh, familiar with. So let's look at when that occurred. There's the sodium ions, there's the ATP that is associated itself with the protein, and then it's going to drop off one of those three uh, proteins. And you're, whole, you're used to the idea that ATP, <coughs> adenosine triphosphate, loses a phosphate group and then that leaves ADP. But most people, when they think of that occurring, they think of the phosphate group that's dropped off as just sort of being released into a fluid. And it floats around aimlessly until it's used for another purpose. And uh, when ATP is used, Usually, the phosphate group doesn't just get released and float around, it's released onto something and bonds itself to something. So for example, when an ATP is used as the uh, energy source for muscle contraction, to get actin and myosin to slide on each other, and uh, um, I think only the seniors would better appreciate that what that mechanism is. But um, the phosphate group that is released from the ATP molecule associates itself with the myosin. Okay, it actually bonds to the myosin. So it phosphorylates the myosin as part of that and it causes one of the actions of the myosin fibers, the heads of myosin to take on a particular conformation. And then when that phosphate group itself is released, that allows the myosin to do another uh, movement in the mechanism. Well, the same thing happens here, okay? The, the original ATP molecule phosphorylated the uh, protein of the so sodium potassium pump, and that caused it to do one thing, okay? Uh, you know, uh, take on and then uh, uh, release the sodium ions. But now that represents stored chemical energy right there. Okay, so we don't need a second ATP molecule because there's a stored covalent bond right there that if it is broken, then it can release its energy. It's like a two for one deal for every ATP. So when potassium ions go in, the next movement is due to the release of the the uh, phosphate group. So ATP was used twice, once when it phosphorylated the protein, and that allowed the movement of taking in and releasing sodium ions, and then that same phosphate group was used again when it was released from the protein, and that allowed the potassium ions to come in and the protein to change shape uh, once again. Another uh, uh, 
um, animation that is in the Pearson book online version that I think uh, would be good to talk about before we get into some of the, the uh, details that I'll do on the board is this whole idea of what is called uh, saltatory conduction. This is uh, uh, represents sort of the difference between uh, neurons of organisms that are considered to be uh, highly advanced, highly evolved, versus those organisms that are highly evolved enough to have a nervous system, but <coughs> their nervous system does more simplified actions and does not do things like analyze information, okay? If an organism, uh, a type of invertebrate, for example, uses its nervous system to recognize uh, ever so slowly, whether it's, you know, what water temperature it's in, so that it can maybe make a movement to get either to warmer water or colder water, um, that's a pretty low level analysis that can be done over a period of time. But if an organism is seeing things, if an organism is making very quick decisions based on things that are occurring in its environment due to sound, due to uh, vision, and that type of thing, well, that sort of analysis requires a much faster nervous system. So not all, but many uh, lower level animals with a nervous system use a uh, axon that has no myelin sheath that are surrounding it. And uh, when, when there is an unmyelinated axon, no myelin, sheath, no myelin sheath, that is called non saltatory conduction. And it basically is uh, the ion movements that we're going to talk about related to the sodium potassium pump, but also there are other protein membranes that are involved with an unmyelinated axon, every bit of the axon has to be used for the ion movements. So this little purple ring, stop. Let me see if I can make it go. It just keeps going. It's out of control. <laughs> so, in an unmyelinated uh, neuron, this triple ring represents where in the axon the ions are moving. Not just the sodium potassium pump, but also uh, when we talk soon about the diffusion of sodium and the diffusion of uh, potassium. That's part of the, uh, not resting potential, but the action potential. That has to occur in a non-myelinated neuron everywhere. And because it's not, you know, like electrons flowing down a conductor, it's ions moving in and out, in and out, in and out, that are stimulating the next area of the neuron to do the same thing, and then the next area of the neuron to do the same thing. It's relatively slow. You know, relatively slow in this case is defined as 0.2 to 2.0 meters per second. Okay, and I'm, that may not sound slow, but if you compare it to saltatory conduction that is N to 120 meters per second, that is a big deal. And it's especially a big deal when you start thinking about how far an impulse has to travel when it's actually within the brain. Okay, getting nervous system information from your receptors into your central nervous system, into your brain, doesn't take that long. Why? Because it's not uh, a very far distance. But what you don't think about uh, so much, or it's not natural to think about it, is how far that impulse is going to travel once it gets to the brain, and it now has to start going through processes that generally are called integration where an impulse may have to go from to maybe uh, 500 different locations within the brain in order to make just simply one uh, cognitive decision about it. You know, the very fact that the thing you're looking at has a round shape rather than a square shape. 
okay? And then you have to do that uh, same kind of thing to decide what color it is. And then you have to do that same kind of thing for trying to make sense of what its texture is. So when you start thinking about all of the places where these impulses have to go, breaking it up into discrete information like color and texture and size and other things, any one uh, thing that you're thinking about or looking at or hearing has a long way to go when it's actually within the brain. And if we were processing information <coughs> using uh, unmyelinated fibers at that speed, uh, we wouldn't be making sense of our world in the same way that we are now. Okay, uh, general rule of thumb is we would be uh, very, very, very slow in reacting. We would be very, very slow in processing and thinking. Uh, we definitely would have to give you more time when you're taking your tests, okay? Because um, it probably would take you 15 seconds to find number 37 on your paper. And then you could start thinking about what number 37 says, and then half an hour later, you would decide to, you know, maybe think about starting to maybe think about answering the question. Okay. But um, it's just not appropriate for higher evolved organisms. So in higher evolved organisms, there are these things called, collectively it's called the myelin sheet, but it's not a continuous thing. It's, it's a cell. Who remembers what the name of the cell is? Schwann cell. It is a Schwann cell located right here that at one time when this axon was developing, this Schwann cell wrapped itself around this axon over and over and over and over again. So what there ends up being in this area that this little blue bubble doesn't show is if you were to go down through the thickness of that part of the myelin sheath, there would probably be 20 to 30 thicknesses of membrane you'd have to go through, okay? And the same thing for this one. This is another Schwann cell that wrapped and wrapped and wrapped and wrapped. And so any one long axon has many of these Schwann cells. And they are areas that when you consider the boundary, right where the axon is uh, first wrapped by the very first membrane, that is an insulated area, okay? And there is no way that ions can diffuse in and out of the membrane in that area. So the way this works is the uh, spacing of these areas between uh, the Schwann cells. They're called nodes of Ranvier. These nodes of Ranvier have to be precisely spaced from each other so that if there is uh, something happening with the ions right here. Ions are moving in and out of this membrane. In other words, there's an action potential right here that on the inside of this axon, this electrical potential must be able to be sensed by the membrane right here. And when uh, an action potential is right here and the electrical potential is sensed by uh, proteins over here, then the action potential can jump over to here. A lot of times on uh, even this animation where they're showing this purple ring, you know, slowly going here and then jumping over to here, it's not jumping on the outside, it's actually jumping on the inside. It's an electrical potential being sensed over here. And, uh, but if you had nodes around VA that were too widely separated from each other, those electrical potentials could not be sensed by the proteins. So it's important that, you know, nature probably solved this by trial and error. You know, everything in evolution is really trial and error um, anyway. So let's run this thing again just so you get the idea of what we're talking about. Very slow conduction, a lot of ion movements. fake jumping that occurs, and a comparison of the two showing the advantage. That's one thing that not only you uh, need to 
uh, talk about if you're writing about this, but you need to not only explain what the saltatory conduction is, but also uh, the advantage of it. You know, why being faster is uh, so much better than being slow. Um, yeah, they can die. They can also um, uh, become too thick. They can become, uh, a lot of it has to do with uh, lipids because they are phospholipid membranes that are building, with, building up. So in diseases like uh, what people generally call Lou Gehrig's disease, it's a disease of the myelin sheath and there are others. Didn't uh, Miss Bidding in ninth grade show some of you Lorenzo's oil? Okay. That disease is a disease of the myelin sheath. And you can see how, uh, from the movie, how horrible it actually is. Um, well, I don't know if there's one that you should know about, but I would say uh, something like a, a sea anemone, you know, with uh, tentacles, and when they, uh, they don't know, they can't see what's around them, but if there is a fish or other marine life that comes in contact with them, they have enough of a nervous system to shoot out their nematocysts to trap them because it's going to be the fish is going to be a food source for them. And they're not advanced enough to have myelin sheets, but their nervous system is fast enough and they're a small enough organism that with the neural net, they have the neurons that they do have, that reaction ends up being fast enough to typically capture the fish. So think of, uh, general rule of thumb, just think of any invertebrate that does not have uh, vision or hearing capability and you probably are identifying a, an invertebrate that has unmyelinated fibers. Somebody get the white wall switch over there. section of a notoron VA of a myelinated uh, neuron. So we're looking at clean membrane here, okay? No myelin sheath surrounding it. And again, I encourage you to think about this three-dimensionally. We're looking at a section through this, but this membrane is like a tube. And there's a fluid in the tube, and that fluid is, again, uh, cytoplasm or uh, intracellular fluid and outside the flu, uh, the cell is the intracellular fluid. So uh, one type of membrane protein that we need to build into this is the um, occasional sodium potassium pump protein. I'm not going to do anything with that in detail, but that is constantly, it never stops, okay? Uh, constantly, it is pumping sodium ions to the outside, and it is constantly pumping potassium. 
potassium ions to the inside. And because of that, <clears throat> and it's not just in that location, it's every single location, okay? And because of that, uh, potassium ions are accumulating in large numbers inside of the, the cell, inside of the cytoplasm, and sodium ions would be constantly accumulating to the outside. Don't think of the sodium potassium pump as something that just works at one time. Uh, nothing turns the sodium potassium pump off unless uh, it can be slowed down by either lack of ATP or uh, not enough ATP to keep it fully running, or if uh, sodium and potassium have been almost perfectly put into the side of the membrane where active transport puts it, okay? So if that happens, if, we, if we've already pumped the vast majority of sodium out here and the vast majority of potassium in here, well, the pump is going to slow down, even if there's ATP available, because remember, there's got to be three sodium, three sodium that enter from this side, and if there's not that many sodium, then it's just going to sit there waiting until there is three. And the same thing for the potassium. There's got to be two potassium that enter from this side, okay? So this is the setup of the membrane when it is at its, when the neuron is at its resting potential. But in addition to those proteins, there's also proteins that are what are called gated channels. Uh, specifically in this case, they are voltage gated channels. put them only on, on the lower side only because that was a cleaner place to put them. You can have a voltage gated channel right next to the sodium potassium pump. You can have one out here where it is closer to you in three dimensions. So they're um, just scattered along the membrane. <clears throat> There's two kinds of them. That's why I drew two different shapes. One of them is a uh, sodium voltage gated channel, and the other one in a type is going to be a potassium voltage gated channel. So, first of all, the term gated channel means that the gate can open and close. Um, some, uh, this is gonna be an example of uh, facilitated diffusion, okay? And in facilitated diffusion, uh, it is a type of diffusion used by either large or polar molecules and no energy is expended, okay? Directly for the diffusion anyway and it does rely on diffusion, therefore there has to be a concentration gradient, but in it, what's called a gated channel, the gate can be closed and opened, not necessarily by ATP, but it can, there is a mechanism to open and close the gate. And in a voltage gated channel, that tells you what opens and closes the, the gate. Okay? So when a neuron is at its resting potential, there is a set voltage on the other side of this membrane in comparison to voltage inside the membrane. And at that voltage where no impulse is being sent because it's at its resting potential, both of these gates would be closed. Why would you leave them open when you've expended ATP 
to pump sodium out and pump potassium in to get them ready to do something. And now you just accidentally leave a gate open, okay? So they leak out. That would not be uh, uh, beneficial, fruitful, or whatever. So when a neuron is at its resting potential, the sodium potassium pump has already put the ions into the position we have shown. Both uh, of the voltage gated channels are closed. But let's say that the uh, impulse now, the impulse has started somewhere down here and it's making its way to this area. What is the impulse? The impulse is what you call an action potential. And it is represented by the sodium only gated channel, channels opening. Why do they open? They're like people. They uh, open because the person right next to them did something. The, the uh, sodium channel right next to the current channel opened up. That changed the voltage and therefore to influence the voltage of the one that is next to it. So if this type right here represents the a sodium channel, then uh, what's going to happen is as the impulse approaches this area, there is going to be a voltage change that occurs. And because the only thing that will influence this channel is a change in voltage, okay, that change in voltage is going to cause this channel to open. And this channel, and this is why it's called a sodium channel, will only allow sodium to pass through. Both sodium and potassium are uh, positively charged with a single positive charge, but they're two different sized ions. And this channel will only allow the sodium to pass through. So what direction will it go? In. Why? We've worked hard, the sodium potassium pump has worked hard to move all the sodium to the outside. It's not just up there, it's down here too, it's all around this, this axon. So therefore, when the sodium channel does open, in response to the nearby voltage change, the sodium ions will move in through this uh, uh, channel, through this, by, simply by facilitated diffusion, okay? So for a little while, right in this area of the membrane, we're gonna have both sodium ions and potassium ions that are accumulating in that area of the channel. If you were looking at this on a diagram that showed only charges, what would the charge be inside of that area of the membrane? Positive. Okay, where was the positive charge before this sodium channel opened? Outside. Outside. Because the, we have more sodium ions out here than we have potassium ions in here, and some negative proteins in here. So this was positive, this was negative. But when sodium ions move to the inside, this area of the membrane becomes positive. Did we add anything negative out here? No. But what charge does it take on simply because of losing so many positive charges to the inside? Negative. Why? It's re they're relative. They're, it's just the difference between charges. We've accumulated so many positive charges in here that this area becomes relatively negative. Okay? So in a simplistic diagram of this same area, what you would see is a small area right here that even though everything else is positive, 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 negative, 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 this area would be negative and positive on the inside. And that area is the area that is showing the what? 
the action potential. This is the action potential right here. And you have a, a question, Ricky? Yeah. Uh, do the Na um, ions move inside in respect to the fact that there's more Na outside than inside or to balance out the charges? No, they don't balance charges. They are moving only because uh, there's many more sodium ions on the outside than inside and the gate when it opens only allows sodium through. So they will move in attempting to reach their own equilibrium. Okay. And it never does actually get to an equilibrium of sodium ions, but it still gets to the point where we get enough move through here that this becomes relatively negative and these two added together makes this relatively positive. Okay. So this is the area of the membrane that if you were saying, where's the impulse? That, that's it, that's the impulse right there, okay? And uh, not only is the impulses there, but this also is the new area of where there is a voltage change. And therefore, what does that new voltage change in this area do to the next area of the membrane? It, it causes the next uh, area, let's change this one to the shape of uh, what I used earlier for the sodium. So it's going to cause this area to now uh, undergo the next change and therefore this sodium gate now opens. Well, the, the question becomes if this is being, the term you use is propagated. If this is being propagated in this direction, why doesn't this voltage change affect a sodium gate in the other direction that it just came from? Any ideas about that? I want you to think the clue is in how the sodium potassium pump has to work. What does the sodium potassium pump require? ATP, ATP but also something else. But I was going to say it wouldn't cause the last one to go because the last one had just gone, it already has the sodium. Okay, so the ions are not in a position for the sodium potassium pump to work. Yes. And in order to get the sodium potassium pump to work, <coughs> you've got to have three sodium ions on the inside, two potassium ions on the outside. Where are our potassium ions in this area? They're inside. We need to get them to the outside. So the next part of this mechanism is this uh, uh, voltage gated channel, which is going to be a potassium <coughs> voltage gated channel, it now has to open. And when it does open, what direction does the potassium diffuse? Out. out. So we start bringing the potassium ions out. And once we get enough potassium ions out and we eliminate them from in here, and we've accumulated sodium in here, what now can work? The sodium potassium pump. But that'll never happen in the area of the membrane just behind where the current impulse is, where the current action potential is, because right behind where it is, both sodium and potassium are on the inside of the membrane. You gotta wait until this occurs, getting the potassium ions out, so now the sodium potassium pump can go back to work and switch those ions. It's a little trick of nature, but it's a very clever trick, okay? It is what keeps this action potential being propagated in only one direction, okay? One trick question, I've never seen AP ask this, but you never know. I have seen IB ask this. Okay, is the question where they 
describe sort of a setup of a, of a neuron, an axon like this, and they ask you, what would happen if you artificially stimulated this neuron right in the middle, right at the middle of the axon? In other words, you, you took a, an electric probe, little needle that gave off just a little bit of uh, electric current, a little bit, little bit of voltage, and you stimulated it right through here. And the question is, what direction will the, the action potential head? It will go both ways, okay? Because aren't the <clears throat> uh, sodium potassium, unless there's a, you assume there's no other uh, action potentials coming down this direction, but this area of the neuron would have had time for the sodium potassium pump to get everything back in position. And this area of the neuron would also have the sodium potassium pump everything in position. So it will go both ways until what? And when it gets to the cell body and therefore the dendrites, what will happen? Nothing. There's no mechanism for a synapse to work at that end of the, the neuron. When the other, when the action potential gets to the other end of the neuron, where the synaptic terminals are, and there is a neurotransmitter, then that end will propagate the action potential to the next neuron. So it's, um, I think they wanted students to say, well, the action potential will only go towards the synapse. And that's just not true. Okay. When does that happen in nature? Probably not very often, you know, but I guess it could happen if, um, you know, somebody is sticking their tongue in an electric outlet or something like that. Um, <clears throat> any questions about this messy diagram before we look at another? Make sense? Sort of, kind of, maybe? potential is the sodium channel open. So whatever sodium does in terms of diffusion, that's the action potential. Then any event that occurs after that is part of repolarization. And the first event of repolarization is opening the potassium channels so you can get both the ions in the opposite position that they need to be in for a resting potential. And then using the sodium potassium pump 
to put them into the uh, final position that they need to be in. Uh, so uh, let's do a, a quick uh, set of terms having to do with uh, typical stimulus and response. Uh, stimulus is something that must be sensed by a, a receptor of the nervous system. And you have some very simple receptors and you have some very complex receptors. But what all receptors are, are uh, uh, cells, they are neurons themselves that are always the very first uh, what you call afferent neuron or afferent neuron. And they've been modified. Nature has modified them. Evolution has modified them to be a transducer for one particular type of physical uh, stimulus. So if it is, so if it is a photoreceptor, then the uh, uh, um, cells of the retina that are the photoreceptors, they are going to be sensitive only to uh, either the intensity of light or to the wavelength of light. And uh, that is the only sort of physical stimulus that they can use. Uh, transducer is a term you probably hear more in physics than you do in biology, but it's a term that basically means something that is designed to transform a type of energy. So a photoreceptor uses the energy of light to be transformed into the energy of an action potential. Um, a um, NOC receptor, which is what you call a pain receptor in the skin, uses the energy of a physical stimulus that has led to what eventually is going to be a sensed pain somewhere in your body, and that physical stimulus the energy of that is going to be transduced into an action potential. So every time the transduction leads to an action potential, the only thing that changes is what the energy is that um, leads to the action potential. And there's a lot of different kinds of energy that can be used. And that's why we're able to hear and see and feel and, and other senses that we have. But every one of these works under a similar set of rules. And the primary rule is uh, geared around what is called the threshold or threshold potential of that particular receptor. Every one of them requires a minimum threshold to be reached which means a minimum amount of energy that has to be applied in order to get the action potential to be uh, originally started and therefore become self-propagating. Um, and it just depends on what the receptor is. For a photoreceptor of the retina, it'll be a minimum intensity of light. Uh, for something that is a, a touch receptor, a pressure receptor, uh, in your skin. They're actually called baroreceptors, B-A-R-O, baroreceptors in your skin. That'll be a, a minimum pressure that's necessary to get that particular receptor to reach its threshold. But once it reaches its threshold, there is no sense stimulating it anymore after that. Because once you get to the minimum, it becomes an all or nothing event. The basic idea is there is either an action potential that is begun or there is no action potential that has begun. There is no medium action potentials or three-quarter action potentials. Every action potential is, is a discrete event that either occurs or it doesn't occur. So um, we talked about this last year. How do you feel? 
different pressures. How do you feel the difference between a light pressure and a uh, um, heavier pressure, so to speak? How do you do it? More and more receptors hit. In the same area? Mm -hmm. So if you like press on one area of your skin, you got some receptors that have a low threshold and then others that are only stimulated with more pressure and therefore they have a higher threshold. It's exactly it. It's why you feel different levels of pain, okay? You have some pain receptors that are not going to be stimulated under certain damage circumstances. Okay, you have other no C receptors, pain receptors, that uh, given, um, uh, you know, they require more damage, more uh, cells to be, uh, you know, disrupted, killed, et cetera, before their, their uh, signal is going to be sent. And our whole nervous system is based on this all or nothing uh, event that, it, that are occurring, millions of them. And um, I mean, it's really astounding the amount of information that your brain is taking in uh, virtually all the time. More so when you're awake than when you're asleep. But even when you're asleep, your, your brain is taking in some information. If it wasn't, then you would never wake up, okay? So there's always some information being sent to your brain. And I mean, you know, just think of the information right now Assuming that you're still awake after all of this, okay? Think about the information that you're putting into your brain right now, just by way of sounds you're hearing, by the visual image that you're seeing. And it's really so much that your brain very early in life learns to ignore most of it. If your brain didn't ignore most of it, then uh, you would have a hard time interacting with the world around you. Um, you need to learn to focus important from unimportant. There's uh, a lot of research that has gone into studying different forms of autism. And autism is very much thought to be a nervous system condition where um, a person with autism uh, doesn't filter out as well as what other people do uh, things that are, quote, important versus unimportant. And therefore, when you have certain types of autism, uh, you're being bombarded with uh, sensory information, visual and auditory information that is, uh, makes it difficult for you to interact with the world. And uh, the way we see a, people, a person demonstrating autism is that they don't interact with uh, people in a predictable way that we expect people to interact. And it's because their world is just so much more complicated than what, what we're understanding uh, with a lot of types of autism. Um, so assuming that this threshold has been reached, there is going to be uh, the original action <coughs> potential, the first action potential. And it'll be a self-propagating wave. It'll be, it'll be exactly that mechanism that I went over with you earlier with sodium channels, potassium channels. Uh, but it is going to have to be passed from neuron to neuron. If our nervous system was just one long neuron, uh, it would not be capable of making sense of anything. It would be interesting that we could get a voltage from one end of the cell to the other end of the cell, but it wouldn't serve any good purpose. So uh, these neurons do have to be able to communicate with each other. And the last thing I'll be going over with you today will be the transmission uh, to the second neuron, which will be by way of a synapse. That's not what this diagram is designed to show you, but that is where a synapse is going to be. And therefore, this will continue along to our second neuron. And as a general rule of thumb, the neurons 
that are uh, in outside of our spinal cord and outside of our brain tend to be very long neurons. Why? Because they're not analyzing anything. They're like telephone cables or internet cables that are carrying a message from point A to point B, and point B is uh, somewhere, usually a pretty long distance from where uh, point A started it. So in our, uh, what is called our peripheral nervous system, <coughs> There are very few synapses. Okay? But there has to be some. Okay? Because uh, there does have to be some uh, routing that occurs <coughs> to get it to the right place within the brain and spinal cord, etc. So there typically are a few synapses. Whenever there is a synapse, the neuron that uh, is sending the chemical that represents a synapse, what is the name we use for that neuron? You can't just say first neuron. It is the presynaptic neuron. So even a receptor cell can be a presynaptic neuron, you know, because that's going to be the first neuron in the chain. The receiving neuron then is considered to be the postsynaptic neuron. But that is not a permanent designation because there very well will be a third neuron. And then in that instance, the postsynaptic neuron at its synapse becomes a presynaptic neuron. And the third neuron the post-synaptic neuron. So it's all just relative to any one synapse, in other words. Okay. Eventually, in order for this uh, action potential to have any meaning whatsoever, it's got to make its way into the, either directly into the brain or into the spinal cord and probably taken to the brain. And that uh, spinal cord and brain is what is called our central nervous system. If it is sensory information that is going to come directly into the brain, what are those nerves <coughs> called that can take it directly in, bypassing the spinal cord? Cranial nerves. C R A N I A L, cranial nerves. How many pairs of them are there? Twelve. Twelve. Name two pairs for me. Two cranial nerve pairs. Optic nerves. Optic nerves. Auditory nerves. Okay, they're better called acoustic nerves, but. I think if you were actually right auditory nerves, somebody would give you credit for it. Okay. So some of them are so basic, so fundamental that you, you know, you there's no way you shouldn't be able to come up with an example or two of cranial nerves. No one is going to ask you to list all twelve cranial nerves, all twelve pairs of cranial nerves. Uh, some of them are pretty uh, obscure. You know, uh, it's uh, uh, probably only Ricky and I know in here of the hypoglossal nerves that control your tongue activity. Okay. Uh, but that is another cranial nerve there. And uh, how about the uh, sensory information that is coming from your arms, legs, and trunk and going into your spinal cord? That's coming in by way of the. Spinal cord, spinal nerves. Okay. So the spinal nerves are, uh, they're not named, they're numbered. Okay. Um, and there's 31 pairs of those. And they're named in the same way that the vertebrae are named. Okay. So 
Um, you probably remember the vertebrae that make up your neck. They're called the cervical vertebrae. And therefore, uh, between every two vertebrae is where a pair of spinal nerves emerge from. Okay, because the vertebrae themselves are solid, so you've got to put two of them together, so you got some flexion in your neck and vertebral column, the rest of your vertebral column. So wherever two vertebrae come together, that's where one pair of spinal nerves emerges. So you, if you were identifying a, the very first spinal nerves you have in the uh, upper end of your spinal cord, they would just be the uh, cervical one spinal nerves, okay, left and right side. And, but unlike the uh, cranial nerves, they don't have names. So um, once you get the, whether it be the spinal nerves or the cranial nerves, once you get it into either the brain or spinal cord, you now have entered into the central nervous system. And if it is going to either directly go into the brain or by way of the spinal cord and then take it to the brain, there's a high probability that it's uh, going to be taken eventually into your cerebrum. And if it does go to your cerebrum, that's where you have a chance of conscious interpretation of what the information is. But you may or may not be conscious of that interpretation. Okay? It gives you the chance to have it be a conscious interpretation. Let's say you have, uh, over the last five seconds, that you have had a total of uh, three uh, million pieces of information sent to your cerebrum. Okay, some of them were visual, some of them were auditory, some of them were pressure related or temperature related. But over the last five seconds, I'm just making this up, you had three million pieces of information sent to your cerebrum. What percentage of those do you think are right now at the conscious level? Where you are aware of them? 10? Okay, that would probably be a high estimate. I would go for maybe uh, uh, one or a little less than 1% maybe at most a little more than 1%. Why? Because any more, <laughs> and, oh, so you're, you're saying for you it's a higher percentage because uh, being like a super being or something like that. 10 out of the three. 10 out of the three. 10, not 10 Just 10 things you're thinking about. No, I was talking about percentage. Oh, no. Okay, about a little less than 1% of the three million. So that's still, you know, many thousands that are going to your conscious level. And, that, and that's what's making up your, your existence right now. The fact that you're seeing what you're seeing and you're hearing what you're hearing. And you're either feeling your uncomfortable butt in the chair or you're not feeling your uncomfortable butt in your chair. But those are the things that give you the capability of making sense of your world. Why? Why do you think you're not uh, interpreting at the conscious level more than that? <coughs> you don't need to. You don't need to, exactly. And the brain, uh, the cerebrum of the brain, needs to pare down those things that are important versus unimportant. It's the same idea as the autism that I talked about earlier. And everybody does it a slightly different way. Okay, and that's why everybody sees the world in a slightly different way. Partly explains why some people have a better appreciation for music and for art, and other people uh, can see the, the same piece of art and just say, okay. <laughs> you know, and somebody else is going, that's the greatest thing I've ever seen. It's because we're all making sense of our world in a slightly different way. We all assume, it's really crazy, because we all assume everybody sees the world the same way we do. And believe me, you don't. Uh, and thankfully, you don't, okay? Uh, be because 
I'm not going to say the next thing I was thinking about. Um, so, uh, what happens when it does go to your brain? A discrete piece of information goes to your brain. I alluded to this a little bit earlier. It doesn't go into your brain the way you probably think it does. Okay? You hold uh, in your brain no one area for any one thing that you're looking at or that you're seeing. In other words, I'm looking at Ricky right now. I don't have an area in my brain for Ricky. Okay? Uh, Ricky, when he goes, when his visual image goes into my brain, his uh, general body shape goes into one area. And then I'm, I'm looking at the colors that represent Ricky, the colors of his hair, his skin, his clothing, and those colors go somewhere else. And then, uh, even though I don't even want to think about this too deeply, my brain perceives that Ricky has a texture. And Ricky's <laughs> texture goes somewhere else. And I'm also thinking about things like, without even knowing I'm thinking about it, I have been from this area of the room to that area of the room numerous times, thousands and thousands of times since I've been in this room. So I know about how far away that is. And I'm seeing Ricky right now as that big. So I'm comparing my distance that I know to Ricky being that big. And it's telling my, or my brain is telling me about how big Ricky is. Because if I didn't have the ability to do that, I would always think Ricky is that big. Wherever Ricky is, that's how big he is. <laughs> and he's not. And my brain has to make sense of that. And that's why it has to go to all kinds of different areas. Everything that goes into your brain gets split up. Which also means when you bring it back out again, when you try to use it, it also has to come from different areas of your brain. All of you that are last minute studiers, if you haven't got broken that habit yet, that's one of the problems with last minute studying, cramming. Especially, if not. I'm talking about review cramming, I'm talking about learning it for the first time right before you're gonna be tested on it. You put it into so few areas of your brain that uh, you might, be able to bring it back, you know, in the um, uh, very immediate future. But, you know, give it more than 24 hours or 48 hours or whatever, and it's just so scattered in your brain that you got no hope of bringing it back. It's just like trying to, re nobody remembers telephone numbers anymore, you know, because you immediately put one into your phone, but trying to remember a telephone number you've heard only one time. You know, it's it just, people are not very good at it. If you're good at it, it's because you say it in your head over and over and over and over again and create all kinds of connections to and from it. And therefore, it is available to you. Okay. So all of this is being done at the uh, conscious level for memory, for personality, for movements, anything that is associated with conscious activity. So uh, another major area of the brain <coughs> is the cerebellum. What is it used for? For motor movements, coordination of motor movements. Uh, if you didn't have a cerebellum, you would not be able to walk or run or swim or do anything with any sort of fluidity whatsoever. Because without a cerebellum, you would have to tell at the conscious level, at your cerebral level, you would have to tell each muscle when to contract and when to relax in order to accomplish one movement. And I don't know if it's true or not, but in some of the, the strange facts that you read in biology, the one of them says it requires 200 muscles to make one step, okay? So think about consciously sending 200 signals to 200 muscles in order to take that one step, okay? And you don't have to do that because your cerebrum says, I wanna take the step, I want to take a step in this direction, and your cerebellum takes over and does all the coordination for it. Okay. How do uh, athletes, or what is the term used for somebody that has uh, not only uses their cerebellum, but has basically trained their cerebellum in a very efficient series of movements? What do athletes call that? 
Muscle memory. Muscle memory. And it's really not. It's cerebellar me memory that you're, you're putting into place. You're putting pathways in order to repeat movements in a very efficient way. Okay. The uh, third major part of the brain that is associated with all of this is your brain stem. And even though there's different parts of this brain stem, and some of you that are also in psychology uh, will probably know more about the individual parts of the brain stem. Uh, the brain stem, as general rule of thumb, is your uh, autonomic <coughs> nervous system. It is those things that you are doing at the subconscious level. I don't know that unconscious is the right term there. Subconscious is probably a, a better term than unconscious. But it's you know regulating heart rate and it's uh, salivating and it's uh, uh, producing or sending a signal to produce <coughs> digestive enzymes and stomach acid and all those things where you go, I don't want to think about that, okay? I don't want to think about what size my you know, radial artery is in order to best regulate the blood pressure at any given time. But your brainstem does that and thousands and thousands and thousands of other things. This is the area of the brain that uh, is absolutely necessary to keep you alive. Uh, it's really, it, no one would enjoy this, but you can lose a huge amount of this due to stroke or gunshot wound or other physical injury. You can lose a significant part of this and still survive, okay? Maybe not just as you are, but still survive. But you damage even one small part of the brain stem and it's almost always terminal. When people are in um, uh, uh, situations where they're Physiology has gone downhill to the point where they are said to be in a vegetative state, a permanent vegetative state. Uh, the reason they're not dead is because their brain stem is still fun functioning. And in most uh, states, if your brain stem is functioning uh, legally, the courts say that you're alive. And then your family gets to decide what to do. Okay, and this is what living wills are, are all about. Okay? If you go into a vegetative state where the only functioning part of your brain is your brain stem, and you don't have a living will that says, I don't want to be artificially maintained, then you are then subject to whatever the laws are of that state. And in Florida, the law basically says uh, the controlling family member gets to decide, okay? So if it's a husband or wife and the other spouse is still alive, the husband or wife gets to decide, either keep them alive or don't keep them alive. If they say keep them alive, but uh, I refuse to pay for it, well then, you know, the court is gonna uh, overrule them and say, you get to decide. Okay, but you also get to pay for it. And uh, keeping somebody alive in a vegetative state is a very, very expensive thing to do. So some people change their mind. They'll say, yes, I want, I want my honey bunny to stay alive as, in a vegetative state. And then they'll uh, say, okay, the hospital or a nursing home will say, the bill for the first month will be $37,000, and for the second month, we're gonna give you a discount. It'll only be $35,000, okay? And then they'll say, uh, nope, let George go. Okay, George has had a good life. Let him go. So, what was the famous court case in uh, Pinellas County? Probably one of the most famous vegetative court cases ever. There was a, a girl. Her name was Harry Scheibel. Probably right before the time you all started paying attention to your to your world, and she was in a, a center down in the uh, Largo area, and uh, she uh, forgot what the circumstance was, but she went into a vegetative state. Her husband was 
the uh, the person that legally could decide whether she stayed alive or not. And her husband said uh, no. You know that she's she's not going to wake up. She's never going to be, you know, a functioning human being again. And uh, Terry Schiavo's parents sued to keep her alive, and the courts had a hard time with it because the laws weren't real clear at that time as to who was the controlling factor. So they kept her alive on a, a persistent vegetative state for a couple of years while this wound its way through the court. And eventually the judge or a judge ruled that the husband did have control over it. And he didn't, uh, the way this is done is typically, uh, I know this is not happy things, but the way this is done is you don't, it's not like an execution where you go, okay, let's inject the lethal chemical. Uh, they just stop feeding. And somebody that's in a vegetative state that doesn't get fed is, uh, there are experts that say they don't feel any pain, uh, they are given water to be hydrated, but without food, it just is a very gradual decline in uh, uh, life. And then eventually they do uh, die. And so that's what happened with Terry. Read about it, so it was an interesting case. Made worldwide news. Made Largo famous. All right, I think that'll be it for today. Good luck, seniors, to all of you.